Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Alphonse Carnicero. I am I am the co-founder of Able Human Motion, which is a startup that emerged from the CREP UPC, and and then we are here in 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 Barcelona. Let's just start with the with the problem. The main problem is that in many hospitals, gate rehabilitation has not changed in the last 50 years. Of course, hospitals like Goodman are an exception, but not all hospitals are like Goodman. In regular uh, hospitals, gate rehabilitation is treated in a manual way. This means that you, 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 the, what you normally see is this. Uh, therapist moving the legs of the patient. And this limits the number of repetitions uh, and limits the clinical outcomes of this rehabilitation therapy. And it's very difficult, of course, to move severe uh, affect, affected patients, like someone that has had a, a, a high uh, spinal cord injury. And then the subjective uh, assessments are subjective for the therapist. This is why 20 years ago, robotic exoskeletons were created with this idea of providing high intensity therapy, good repeatability between one movement and the next one, so the patient can learn, adjustable assistance, and assessments that are quantifiable because it's a robot no? and can provide uh, objective metrics. But then the huge question, why these robotic uh, rehabilitation tools are not implanted in all these hospitals? There are five main reasons for that. The first one is the adaptability. In a hospital, you treat patients, as Eloy said before, each patient is different. So you need to treat several uh, patients with the same uh, tool. And this is challenging from a technical per, uh, point of view. Then the weight of these devices is also critical if you want to move, uh, to, to facilitate movement for, for the patient. And also if you want to transport the device from one uh, place of the gym to another one. And then the donning and doffing time, the time that you take to put the device on and to take it off is critical. Uh, as you know, in the, in the clinical setting, time is money. So if you use half of your therapy time just for putting on the device, it's, it's something that will not be used there. Then therapy supervision, the patient is not staying in the, in the hospital forever. So the goal is to try to reduce the amount of supervision so the patient can be independent, uh, as independent as possible. And finally, it's also senti sensitive to the price. So there are many uh, small clinics that cannot afford the high price of these devices. Here you can, we can see the two main uh, players in this exoskeleton industry. In blue, uh, you can see a device that adapts very well to different patients but weights 28 kilos uh, and, and, and the cost is almost 200,000 euros. And in yellow, you see another one, which is also very heavy and also takes 30 minutes just to set up for a specific patient. And this is why we create a table. This is what we have been pushing during these five years to try to improve the state of the art of this exoskeleton technology. And this is what we have achieved. A device that adapts very well to different conditions, whether you have a spinal cord injury, you have a, a multiple sclerosis or a stroke. Then the weight, we have been able to reduce the weight to 17 kilos. Uh, a patient can put the device on in just seven minutes and the price is reduced compared to the other solutions. Here you can see a video of our device with a complete paraplegic patient that is using it with complete independence. The opportunity, you know, how big is this market? It's not huge. There are not many hospitals specialized in rehabilitation. In fact, there are around 16,000 in Europe and the United States, which is not a huge, uh, a huge market. But this is just the beginning. This is why we, as a company, we're also working on a exoskeleton for, uh, for personal use. So people with spinal cord injury or other conditions can uh, buy it and use it at home for daily mobility. And this is a device that we are currently, is, is in, we are doing some, some developments here. And we expect to launch the second device in the, in the year 2026. And it will be a device that the price will be much more reduced, will be the price of a high-end uh, electric wheelchair. So 
those people that that have the money can spend it and and use uh, and, and and be able to walk again in their daily lives so here's an example this is a patient that we saw before in a in a trade show just having a beer with with uh, and socializing with the people no the first thing that these people t uh, tell you when when you when you talk with them is i am tired of watching the the bats of the of the people I, 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 and, and they really enjoy the sensation of being standing again. So, what we did during these five years? First, getting funding, very important if you want to do something. So we were able to um, get 1.5 million from private investors, and then we complemented this with a lot of public funding for research and innovation, uh, around four, 4 million euros from private funding. Then, with this money, we built an amazing team of very young, talented individuals that you can see here. Uh, we have hardware and software engineers, we have regulatory and quality guys, and we also have people that work on the market and clinical needs. Then, with this, we evolved the, 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 the product, and you can see how it has changed in these five years it's it's like a different a different we are building a different thing and in this process more than 30 uh, clinicians have been involved actively involved more than 200 patients have been contributing with their feedback during this process and 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 they uh, and they were able to walk more than 400,000 steps also when you create when you create a new company, you have to work also on, in intellectual property protection. So you, we have a portfolio of more than ten patents, international patents covering the innovations behind this new device. Then, if you want to manufacture a device, you need to have a quality system according to the ISO standard thirteen four eight five as a medical device manufacturer. And then you need to work with clinics such as Institute Goodman or Heidelberg University Hospital, other clinics specialized in neurorehabilitation that has this academic background to uh, do clinical trials and publish the results in scientific journals. And we are at the end of this tunnel, uh, very uh, approaching sales, which is our next goal, but we are not yet there. We sent the documentation in April last year for the CE mark as a medical device, and we are still waiting. So it would, do, it would take like a, a, a year, we assume, to get the CE mark. Meanwhile, while we wait, we already have 10 uh, clinical institutions that have committed to purchase the device. So basically, they are waiting for us to get the CE mark and start uh, shipping the first devices. So then uh, Michelangelo also uh, asked me to, to provide some uh, feedback on, on what we learned during these five years and what's important to innovate in the healthcare sector. The first one is to focus on a need, not in a product. And this is very important because uh, sometimes the, the ego or the, 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 the passion, uh, can, 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 can you make forget the, about this? The important is the need, not the product. The product can evolve. And in fact, this is the main reason why companies fail, that, that they, they have no need, there is no market need for such a product. So this is very important. And related with that, we will see the whole picture. So what, what I have shown you before is a team of engineers. But engineers are able to solve problems, but we don't know which are the problems of the world. So we need to collaborate first with researchers. And in this case, in our, in our case, we collaborated a lot with the UPC. Uh, and, 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 and these are people that can help you a lot to understand, to, to uh, make scientific publications, to uh, do clinical research. But please, researchers in the room, go out of the lab, go out of the university. Don't stay there. You need to learn from the world and involve clinicians. And when I say involve clinicians, it's not involving one clinician from Barcelona. It's, invo it's involving a representative uh, part of the clinician. So involve clinics from different countries, involve private clinics, involve public hospitals. You need to learn from different backgrounds and involve end users. End users are also a very important part of your solution. And not only a man, a, 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 a white man, involve many of them, women, men, 
uh, older people, people uh, with uh, that had the injury last year, others that had it 20 years ago, you need to have a representative sample. And this is the key to create innovation in healthcare. This co-creation between all these different stakeholders. And none of them is, import is more important than the others. None of them can work alone to create something that is really meaningful. If not, we create solutions that then stay in a shelf in the university and nobody uses. So this is the, pro the process that we have followed. We made uh, interviews, focus groups with patients to learn about the needs. I started the project five years ago and, and how I started, I took my scooter and I went around to visit patients, to visit clinics, and Eloy knows this very well because this is how we met the first patients that used our first prototype. Then, after these interviews and focus groups, do a lot of usability testing. Test the, the prototypes as soon as possible. Be build quick prototypes and test them. Iterate quickly. You need to fail fast, no? as, as, as Juan before said. And then, when the solution is ready and you see that it's working in, again, in, in, a, in sufficient people, uh, it cannot be that you have tested in two people and then you do clinical trials. It's not how it works. When you test it with 50 people, then you go to clinical trials. Because clinical trials are expensive and they, and they take time. You need to prepare a lot of documentation. You need approvals. No, uh, it's, it's a long process. So you need to be sure that the solution at least is usable uh, for different patients when you go to this next phase that is clinical trials. And then after clinical trials, you uh, get the regulatory approval and finally go to the market. So uh, please listen properly to the market, listen uh, and learn quickly. And, and this is with what probably will happen if you do this with your product, that you will start as we did there in the left uh, of the screen with an orthopedic device, and you end up with a completely different thing, but at least it's what the market needs. Okay. Ah, okay. Uh, now you're interested. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> how uh, a hub can help during the, for, for this process? First, providing these connections with these uh, critical stakeholders, especially if we're in the academia, clinical institutions, and patients or end users. Then, to speed up all this process that I showed you in, in the slide before, uh, up to the clinical uh, trial phase to get research expertise from the academia, to get access to funding. We had, as I, uh, as I showed you before, 4 million euros from public funding. And this is because we have collaborated with several partners building European uh, consortium projects to validate and to improve our solution. It's a mutual benefit. If we, private uh, and public uh, entities, collaborate, then this also helps the academia to do research on things that are market driven, not just publishing by the sake of publishing. And talent pool, very important also for a small company. Uh, uh, working with the academia allows us also to get access to people that is finishing, for example, the, the, the degrees in engineering and that are very capable of, uh, of, of, of working in the, in the company. And then it also gives us visibility and credibility to then raise uh, money from uh, private investors. But what a hub should not do? Have a national uh, mindset and a narrow-minded approach. Uh, should be able to involve all these four stakeholders that I have explained, not only two of them, all of them, and actively, it is important. It should not be disconnected from the industry or market needs. It should focus solely to research with, uh, so not, not focus only to research uh, without application, as I said before. Uh, and this is also a key takeaway uh, from, from my talk. Sometimes the skills for a researcher are not, so the, not always, the skills for a researcher are not the skills for an entrepreneur. And sometimes people think that it's the same. It's not the case. There is people that are researchers that can learn to be an entrepreneur, but it's not always the case. So allow other people with different skills to grow and to be and to be entrepreneurs. And don't have a lot of bureaucracy to join the network and, and to join the, the, the hub. 
And, and this is just a, a wish, uh, please don't, don't take IPR rights or, or, or share rights in the company because we all need to live and it's not easy the life of a businessman in this case. I am interested uh, in how did you navigate being a company that I'm understanding came out of the UPC, right? And you guys got established as a company. How did you navigate the tech transfer into a new company? And because the interest of a researcher is publishing, the interest of a company is having um, patents, right? And 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 it's just the opposite. They are opposite goals and interests that drive each one of those groups. How did how do you manage all that tech transfer and how, or how did you guys do it personally, right, as a company? It's a very good point and the negotiation for that took me a, a year of my life uh, with, the, with the university. But uh, yeah, the, the interests for each party are different. In our case, we started the project. I, I worked in the beginning for the UPC and uh, the, the UPC had a patent on this uh, initial technology. So what we agree, uh, what we work is in this uh, agreement to license this patent to the company in the beginning, and then since then all the patents, all the new developments have been developed uh, by the company. So the company is the sole owner of those patents. Okay, thank you.